welcome to Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes. Joyous conversations about what the afterlife evidence and modern science combine to tell us is true about our one reality. You have nothing to fear. You are eternal and you are perfectly loved. Knowing the truth changes everything. Now, here's Roberta. Welcome to Seek Reality. I'm Roberta Grimes and I'm so happy you're with us today. My friends, as you know, near-death experiences have nothing to do with actual death. The perfectly delightful Dr. Raymond Moody, who coined the term near-death experiences, told us that fact himself when he was our guest on Seek Reality some years back. He said that, of course, NDEs don't have anything to do with death. That's why I called them near-death experiences. But still... NDEs can be extraordinary, spiritually transformative experiences all by themselves. And when they happen to very young children, our spirit guides pull out all the stops. Our guest today had just such an amazing near-death experience when he was only three years old, and it quite literally rocked his childhood and his life. Jacob Cooper is a clinical social worker, a certified Reiki master, and a certified hypnotherapist who specializes in past life regression therapy. Jake works privately with clients through online services, and because he was especially inspired by his spiritually transformative experiences, by by the awakening and by the transformative encounters he had, he also facilitates spiritual awareness and empowerment through life-changing seminars. He lives and he practices in Long Island, New York. His first book is called Life After Breath, and it begins with his really remarkable near-death experience at the age, I cannot believe it, three years old. Welcome, Jacob. I'm so happy to have you with us today. Roberta, a true, true honor. I don't say that lightly. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Oh, you're so sweet. (laughs) I loved your book. I just finished reading it. Let's talk first about what what happened to you when you were three and you were on the top of a slide. What an awful place to have such an experience. Yeah, you know, right in a playground and whatever the term you want to use it, or God or the universe, but the universe has a sense of humor and works in very funny ways too. And I, I say this because I had it in a playground and there's so much allegory and euphemisms that we could have through this you know, experience, but I had something called whipping cough, otherwise, otherwise known as pertussis, um, probably the other way around. But um, I went to a playground in September of 1993, and as a result of this whipping cough, I coughed and suffocated while I was climbing a ladder onto a slide. You know? And so from losing the entire breath of the body, I was able to let go to awaken myself to another breath in another world, what I call as referred to as the breath of eternity, that really kind of propelled me forward from that, you know, experience. But I mean, it, it was a very vivid experience. You you t- talk about it. You you saw beings. You you uh, you woke up on the ground, but you uh, they they weren't sure you were alive. You it was really a, an amazing experience. It was full blown. Um, You know, I know you mentioned Dr. Moody's work. It had a lot of the stereotypical near death or, you know, spiritually transformative experiences that you see when people, you know, their bodies are giving out on them, stuff like that. But for myself, um, it just reminded me that all these beings in love is always around us. We sometimes just lose sight of it on the human journey. But yes, I was able to have full-blown encounter with my spirit guides, um, which we could get to a little bit bit in the show, Um, awareness of my soul family that greeted me, awareness of angels that was all around me, even hovering over my body on the earth plane, um, and much more, including previous lives awareness, you know, reviews of those, some of those lifetimes that were pertinent to this lifetime, um, you know, and just just connection to the centerpiece of creation or whatever you want to call that. But to me, that the all that ever is and ever was and all things emanate from. And so it was profound. Uh, but yes, at three years old, it's a lot different than a <laughs> lot of you know experiencers that you see who are kind of 
you know, it's a little bit of like that movie hook that I allude to with Robin Williams is kind of like middle age and he goes and has these kind of like weird kind of experiences It takes him to kind of Neverland. Then he comes back and then he's like changed. And a lot of people, they're just living these con what we call conventional lives and they have this shakeup of the body and they can never come back the same. They're changed. Um, you know, so it's, it was profound, but infant and children near death experiences do occur. In fact, I will share this. I was in a restaurant, what I call a random restaurant on my trip to Maine in Connecticut. And I'm sitting in the restaurant and lo and behold is a man who endorsed my book, New York times bestselling author, Dr. Bernie Siegel walks in the restaurant and I looked at him. I'm like, this man looks familiar, but I don't want to approach him. He looked like, you know, any guy, you know, that age bracket. Uh, but then I spoke to him and I, it was him. But he also, Dr. Bernie Siegel, why I bring him up is he also had a near-death experience as an infant. So they do happen. Um, but sometimes people may be, you know, less likely to talk about them or they take time to process. Uh, but they are out there. And if people who have had a near-death experience as an infant, I do recommend checking out, and I don't want to market books here, but a, but a book for this topic is The Forever Angels by PMH Atwater is a great book for infant and children near-death experiences. She really does highlight a lot of this phenomenon. It's not actually that uncommon for, for young children to have near-death experiences, right? but, but there are Many people who have near-death experiences have negative near-death experiences. Distressing, Children never yeah. do. For um, and and uh, just to answer another question that many people have, uh, it was so: How do we know people don't die and come back to life? Very simple. Um, the 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 Book of Ecclesiastes is where we first get the um, the term silver cord. There is mm. a, a a very elastic. Um, uh, uh, energy cord which attaches your energy body to your material body when that cord breaks you die and you don't come back if that cord doesn't break you don't die and you come back and you're able to go back into your material body that the the breaking of that cord is actual death and if you're um, if, if you die you don't come back if you don't die the cord doesn't break so that is how we know, and that is how Dr. Moody would tell you, uh, you know, you die or you don't die. It's that simple. Um, mm. But you didn't die. You were a little child, and they took you to the hospital, and you got over that episode of whooping cough. Mm. But it did mess your life up quite a bit. You, you kind of, you came back, of course, from it. But reading your book was really quite gripping. Um, talk about Talk about how you kind of, you, you know, you were kind of out of step for, mm. for, for really much of your life then after that. Well, say from this experience, when I was deprived of my own breath, you know, it was kind of like a car that wasn't working. And so there was no point in me being in my car. I got out of my car, but my whole body and my whole brain, you know, was deprived of oxygen. And so at least for me, I could only speak from my own experience. Once my brain was deprived of oxygen, I literally felt a snap in half of my brain. And as the saying goes, you know, my brain cracked in half and that's when God came in, but that literally happened to me. Uh, so I mentioned this because after this experience, my brain was much different. It was a clear filter of the two worlds, which I do believe is what it was intended to, you know? And so it wasn't blocked by my human experience, you know, like a lot of us, it was an open channel for the higher worlds, you know, until this world. And so practically speaking, I was having a lot of interdimensional communication, you know, with spirits and loved ones, you know, after this and de deprivation of oxygen on a physical basis wasn't the only suffocation that happened to me. I think it happened to me on an emotional and spiritual level. And I say this because I was having these experiences and I, no one was around me was having these experiences. And so I kind of felt very alone and I felt very isolated. Like I was in my own little bubble and everyone was outside of it. And so 
to survive, I really kept this stuff very much to me. I didn't really talk about it, although I did find out recently that my father mentioned that I told him I had this profound experience, but it won't make sense to him until later in life. But one day, you know, he will understand. And he said, I told him point blankly, you know, shortly after this experience. So, you know, and I, I, this is common for a lot of near death experiences where the experience is so sacred that you don't want to tell anyone you need to process it. It needs to take time for many reasons. Uh, but I felt very, I guess, you know, different uh, than the norm. And looking back on it, different is the coolest thing that you can do or be. <laughs> but it's not as a kid, though. As a kid, you want to fit in. You want to be be the leaf in water. So it was it was a very different upbringing. Um, and it was it was hard. There's no one to consult with. I didn't walk around saying I had this experience or this is psychic phenomenon. There was no words or labels, which is why I'm internally grateful for Raymond for having that term, because at least for me, this is something tangible that was universal um, and gave because a language to. In the very beginning, you didn't know, you didn't have a term for what had happened to you. And no. <laughs> and, and, and and to top it off, you were part of an Orthodox Jewish community and family and a family of high achievers. So you really were I mean, a, a sort of out of sync with everything. You were in a in a family of high achievers, in an of in an, in a family that was 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 rigorous in its in its religious beliefs and its in its cultural um, conditioning. And so you were even more out of sync than the average person perhaps would be who was culturally only American and not as culturally conditioned as your family was. Mm. So it was, it was clear in reading your book that you really were out of, out of sync. Um, I, I really felt for you as a child. Right. And, you know, and I think later in life, I was able to be empowered you know, to trust in my own experience and my own connection with spirituality versus what maybe I have been conditioned to or taught. And so I think through hearing these encounters, my hope is that viewers are able to be empowered with what feels right deep down inside. Because when you look at it, I know you mentioned the silver cord, you know, all these things that we speak about are deep rooted in the Bible. And yet the Bible, you know, in religion, you know, to me is a in many ways, the furthest thing from spirituality in, in some degrees, it, it yes. doesn't, you know, you know, but, but all these things are, are the roots of it um, at the core. They're there, you know, angels, um, near death experiences, you know, all these things are included within the deep, you know, if you look deeply into it, but it's not highlighted. It's more um, into the rules and the laws and the, you know, all these things that you need to do to receive love. And that's a human condition, but it's not a spiritual condition. I know I, I learned that we are loved for who we are. Not so much what we do minute to minute. There's an unconditional uh, acceptance, at least from their end, not always from our end to ourselves, right? And and you, you also, um, how did you know about your past lives that you had, you had, um, committed suicide in a past life. How did you know about that history? Well, it's not like I walked around saying past lives. I think reading, you know, books by Dr. Brian Weiss and all these other people, that term came to me. Why I say that is it just didn't seem to be from another time as when you're there, it's, it's one time. Uh, but in my near-death experience and subsequently uh, in, in my spiritual transformative experience and, and subsequently after it, I had these continual dreams, you know, and visions of this, of these lifetimes that I, I've lived. And so I thought it was kind of cool, uh, but also invasive of what I wanted to do. I just wanted to move forward and live a life, but I would always have this phenomenon come up to the surface, kind of like a beach ball that I was continually trying to push down that would always just come up and it was to me more so annoying than anything else. It's like, I wanted to focus what's in front of me, you know, but all these doorways, you know, kind of opened up, you know, in the room that I was in the house that I was in. 
and I was kind